Jerry Anderson and the Century 21 team made magic. Well, we were probably the the dot-com company of the 60s, that's my view. The likes of Stingray, Thunderbirds and Captain Scarlet captured imaginations and spawned a merchandising empire, the likes of which had never been seen before. And we had badges, books, and sweets, and we had everything, and we were every conceivable. The TV21 magazine became one of the most popular publications of the day. And there were stacks of these papers in all the news agents, and we looked at each other and said, well, what have we done? But by Tuesday, I promise you, by Tuesday, we had a sellout. And all of this success came from a team of incredibly talented and hard-working individuals. We, we used to offer it in concerts. We had a club of five. The biggest share properly went to Jerry and Sylvia. Certainly next in ranking would be Joe Reed and Reg Hill. But one other individual would be crucial to Century 21's success. And then, because I was the latest last to join the group, it was Keith Shackleton. Keith Shackleton was born in April 1929. He first met Jerry Anderson during his time at the Royal Air Force in 1948. A keen and driven business mind, in 1960 he left his stable full-time job to work on the merchandising arm of AP Films. Jerry persuaded me that it would be a good one. So I rang my wife and I said, darling, I've done something silly. I said, what have you done? I said, I've taken a job with a company called AP Films. The rest, as they say, is history, and in this episode, we're bringing that to life. This is the complete story of the Century 21 merchandising empire, from supercar to space 1999, told by the man behind it all, Keith Shackleton. So I joined, we had a small office on the Slough Trading Estate. Brick walls, one desk, clean sheet of paper, no secretary, telephone. But I think we had the drive. We were probably the the dot-com company of the 60s. That's my view. And uh, looking back, I think Jerry was the... He was the king of hardware, and Sylvia was the queen of software. And they made a... I mean, a perfect... The creatively, it was absolutely magnificent. Jerry was marvellous with uh, the vehicles. The explosions, the special effects. And Sylvia, the characterization and voices and so forth, uh, well, they, they were brilliant. Calling Parker from Fab One. Mission successfully completed. On my way home. And the other members of the team, there was Reg Hill, who was an extraordinary artist, very creative, and he could capture some of Jerry's and indeed some of his own visions and do the most magnificent full-color illustrations of space vehicles and whatever. You've really caught a likeness. Yep, it's, uh, it's, it's nearly finished. And the other guy was John Reed, who was a lighting cameraman and... Uh, Again, in his own field, quite brilliant. Right, Joe. Cover the takeoff. So we had a wonderful team of, you know, five people, uh, plus all the other talent that came on board, and Derek Meddings and the Brian Johnsons, the Bob Bells. I, I can't remember all the names now, but it was a it was a marvelous time to be, and I. I look back with great affection on those times. I want you to start at the beginning and tell me the whole story. Well, it goes back a long time. Uh, Jerry and I were in the Air Force together just after the war, and uh, which was quite a good time to be in because you had the excitement, experience, and free thinking that came through from some of the guys who'd been in the war. And we ended up at uh, Manston together in air traffic control, which in fact was the root of all the technology that you see in the series, particularly in, in Thunderbirds. But Jerry and I used to socialize, we played tennis together, we played chess together. I mean, I used to beat him at one of them, I can't remember which it was, but a uh, lot of fun. But even after, we used to get on our bicycles and cycle into Margate. And I can't remember the name of the pub, but there was a pub there we used to, it was our first port of call. And there was this rather defeat young man, he was so, I say young man, he was older than we were, but, uh, 
he used to play the piano, and I remember his favorite piece was, I've been a wep, I've been a wren, I've done my bit boys, we were so-called men. I'm a good girl, a good girl now. I mean, that was his party piece, and he used to give that every Saturday night. So after a couple of pints, we'd um, either have a game of darts, or we'd go back to the camp. Or, or, but Jerry, um, was he hadn't played rugger in his youth, so he didn't know how to handle a pint. And I'd been from a school, and we had we did play rugby hand. I was initiated in the art of handling a pint, so I used to um, hold his hand and tuck him into bed at the close of the proceedings. Tom Bass, David. Course, yeah, chap, course. We, and we used to go, I used to go to his home in North London, met his mama, who was quite a difficult lady. But I say we used to play chess. I think, I'm sure it's chess I used to beat him at. I, I don't believe it. Okay, at tennis, he was probably better at tennis than myself, but... Um, we had fun. We had fun. And that was the basis. I mean, we were quite disparate and separate and quite different people, but uh, we seemed to have um, a certain uh, chemistry that worked, and uh, we had fun. It was Battle of Britain Day, and I think it was September sometime, I can't remember the day, and there was this guy, again, I can't remember his name, and I met him, a uh, pilot, and they was giving an air display with a mosquito. And he came in low uh, over the airfield, did a barrel roll at about 150 feet and didn't pull out. And he, he hit the road, uh, there were two engines on a mosquito, hit the road up either side, cabbage field, hit cars. I mean, there was absolute mayhem. And uh, I was probably, well, I was on the air, at the air traffic control. I wasn't on duty. But um, it was, uh, it, I can still feel the the gut feel now when it happened and quite a few people were killed including the past of course this poor chap's wife was she was there when she saw it happen but I think the whole ethos of, uh, of, of the supermarination and the way special effects came from uh, uh, air traffic control I mean there's nothing more you're sitting there at your control desk which today's terms is relatively primitive but uh, you know you had your RT radio telephone equipment and uh, that was about all. I could talk to the home of the direction finding base, and, and you were just talking to the pilot and talking him down, uh, either in fair weather or foul. And the jargon that you hear in Thunderbird is almost straight out. Of, it's it straight out of uh, out of the the book for um, the RAF. But, uh, so yes. It certainly had an influence, and I'm sure, I mean, Jerry has a very technical mind, and um, it stayed with him, and he developed those thoughts and brought them to life in, 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 in well, supercar, you know, fireball. It's all part of the, the whole of the whole scene. And Jerry and I are of a similar age. I, I can pull rank on him, actually. I'm three weeks older to the day than Jerry. So I, if we ever got into a I, I said, Jerry, look, I'm three weeks older than you. So it's my, my, my view must come across and count. But, uh, so after that, uh, we kept in touch, New to have a pint every year. And late 50s, early 1960, he said, why don't you join our outfit? I said, Jerry, I know nothing about filmmaking, and I've got a very secure job. I was business manager at the time of industrial and trade fairs, and we were just involved in doing the first British trade fair in Moscow, which was quite exciting. The only fly in the orbit, as far as I was concerned, was my immediate boss, who didn't have any imagination or sense of humour. Um, and Jerry persuaded me that it would be a good move. So I rang my wife and I said, darling, I've done something silly. I said, what have you done? I said, I've taken a job with a company called AP Films. And uh, it's, uh, I, I joined the company in mid-60, I think it was. So in May I was in Moscow, in July I was found myself in, in New York. And <clears throat> at the time, I say the first uh, strip we did was with the strip cartoon story, it was with TV comic, which is supercar. And we usually self-effacing, but I'd like to say it, it was definitely my idea. And that brought me into contact with a great guy called Alan Fennell, who eventually became, I'm not sure this full-time script writer, but he did a lot of the scripts quite a number of the series. And I used to sit down and brainstorm with uh, Alan 
And I said, Alan, I've got this idea for this children's comic. And I was very mindful of The Eagle, which uh, was the preeminent comic in those days, created by a retired reverend. Well, I don't know whether he was retired or not. Marcus Morris. And he came up with this good, clean comic for kids uh, called Eagle, which was the most, probably the most successful comic ever. And in his day, he was selling over a million copies a week. So I had this copy of Eagle. I said, that's, that's our market. That's what we're going to build. And Alan went away after you know, several meetings and came up with a, a marvelous dummy, which I was so excited about. I took it straight to a publisher. I'll come back in a moment. But the working title was Century 21, because by that time, we changed the name of the company from AP Films, which was a bit uh, anonymous to me and think, into Century 21, which I think reflected what we were about and what we were trying to do. So the working title for the comic was called Century 21, and it eventually became TV 21. We were very nervous about TV 21 because in those days, in their acronyms and short, it didn't, it, I mean, it would work today, but it, in those days, I think, again, we were pioneering. And I took it to a publisher and they said, we love it, but it's not our scene. I took it to Lou Grade. I said, Lou, we want to launch this. I want 30,000 pounds, please, to launch this comic. And he said, geez, he said, go out and license it. And he introduced me to, uh, well, before that, I, w I went and had a meeting with uh, all people of the news of the world. It was run by the Carr family. And I met a, guy, a lovely guy called Clyde Carr, who's currently a director of Arsenal Football Club. And I go there most week now. Um, and they had a company called City Magazines. And we did a joint venture with City Magazines. We were responsible for the editorial, and we have built a department eventually uh, in Fleet Street, 167 Fleet Street, and we had 120 people on the pay payroll producing two comics and books or whatever. Uh, we, we did the creative side, and City Magazines did the uh, distribution and the promotion. So we had this comic, uh, we launched this, I don't know, 63, 64, I can't remember the day. And um, we decided to have it printed in Liverpool by a firm called Eric Ben Rose, I think they're still there. Um, went up with our team, and I was given a, a pride of place, and I pressed this green button to start the press rolling, and we printed 700,000 copies, which was a lot of paper, I can tell you. We put them in the shops, and we all went round like uh, expectant mums or whatever on a Saturday morning. And there were stacks of these papers in all the news agents, and we looked at each other and said, well, what have we done? By Tuesday, and I promise you by Tuesday, we had a sellout. So we, I wouldn't say we had instant success, but it was, I, I've never seen anything quite like it, and the euphoria was unbelievable. And that continued, I mean, the circulation of that grew. Uh, and the following year, we launched, we launched another uh, in children's weekly called Lady Penelope, and that eventually, settled down to about 500,000 copies. So at, at our peak, we were selling 1.2 million copies per week of this publication. Uh, we took it to Holland and we did a deal there. We had a, a Dutch language edition selling 100,000 copies a week. So we had a, a sister publication in Holland doing 100,000, which was fantastic. It was, it was going to be a newspaper. I mean, it was a newspaper and we, it was post dated. Uh, I mean, it was dated into the 21st century. Um, and that was part of the charm, because we, we ran a, a dateline, which was uh, 2000, whatever it was, I can't remember the dates. So, uh, and it, we, the style of, the, of it, the front page was newspaper style. So we had banner headlines and so on. Um, so we wanted it to be different. Uh, most comics of the day had strip cartoons on the front. We had real stories, well, we put them across as real stories, and they read like real stories. So we were treating our readers uh, like young adults, which of course they were, and uh, they let start to it. We got a lot of acclaim for the creativity of the, of the, of the whole project. We, we were all involved, I mean, people say you can't create in committee, um, but I think with the right committee, you can, and it was, we were all sufficiently relaxed and free thinking that we could take ideas on board. And I don't believe anybody had the monopoly of of the creativity, and we'd sit down and um, uh, and and Jerry, 
He was there, sure. I mean, he was there, but he was very busy making films too. Um, but if ever we needed an inspiration, we'd uh, find an excuse to have a lunch together or a bottle of wine or whatever, and we'd sit around and, uh, and talk. And it's amazing what you can do across uh, the table with uh, a few like-minded people. And we were all pointing in the same direction. Nobody was concerned about ego, I don't think. Um, I mean, you know, film credits are a different matter. But, you know, it's we were all enjoying the success. That's that's where I see it, and um, it came through. I think in in the series and indeed in the product. And uh, enthusiasm is a is a wonderful uh, attribute to have. And you can't con if you've got true enthusiasm, it's very difficult to contain it. And it was self almost self-fulfilling. We believed in ourselves and had tremendous energy. Well, I think we were, we were leaders uh, at the time. There were uh, several um, uh, other companies in the field, obviously. I think we, would, uh, we were enthusiasts, we had the energy, we had the drive, and the good fortune to be handling a wonderful series of programs that it, it, it turned out to be. Uh, it, we had a cold start with Supercar, but we built on it. One of the first deals we did was with TV Comic. Um, we, they saw the strengths of what we were doing and we ran a weekly strip with them. And then we built um, a whole raft of licensees. I used to do a lot of co what I call cold, but it's just only called cold calling, knocking on people's doors. And you got a fairly dusty reception from some people. I remember walking out of one office, a fairly major toy company, and uh, they were, you know, they were quite rude. I said, well, you know, if, if this is your approach to it, I don't even know why you're giving me the time for a meeting because, you know, you... so I, I didn't, I said, I think I'll close the meeting because I walked out with my... There, yes, there's no doubt that we were at the leading edge of uh, licensing. I think Disney had, had tickled it uh, without realizing what they were doing. I mean, they had Mickey Mouse and, and all the rest. But we were the first UK company, I think, of any consequence uh, to tackle it. I was going to say scientifically, it wasn't. We were driving about the seat of our pants, and I think a lot of businesses, uh, it's um, it's inspirational. It's how you feel about it. Uh, and I got hold of a supercar, and I say I took it to America as a project. Uh, the reason being that uh, ATV, through their distribution company ITC, got a phone call one day and said, oh, we placed the rights with a company called LCA, Leisure Concepts. No, sorry, Licensing Corporation of America. And we gently pointed out that they hadn't got the right to do that. But if those fellows have dedicated themselves as we have, who are we to complain? But they're using our name, Mr. Tracy, and they've copied our uniforms. I know, Tintin. So we had a quick meeting at, at Saha, and it was decided I should go to the US of A, which I did. So I was... Uh, full of self-confidence and um, as one always is and I got to New York and I, I went in to see the head of ITC, a lovely man and he didn't have any problems I said these are our rights so I took him back and I walked out with the rights and went had a meeting with uh, Stan Weston who eventually became LCI uh, there's a concept inch and the wheel goes full circle 20, 30, 25 years down the line we did a deal with them uh, the daughter was running at Cindy Weston. And we, the last major licensing program I handled in this country um, through a social company of Century 21, which we still have, by the way, uh, was the Power Rangers, which was a huge success. So what I learned in my, th my Thunderbird days, we put to good use in, uh, was in, in the Power Rangers. So we built our own empire. And it's amazing when you're on a roll, you can create the role and uh, we'll continue the role, and that's what we did. Um, we devoted, we identified the opportunity and we went for it. And the whole, we used to have meetings talking about the licensing opportunities. And whilst, uh, unlike some of the programs today where you've got product placement and so forth, we used to build the merchandise in in a natural and spontaneous way, so it really belonged to the show, no more so than if you look at uh, the five vehicles in, in Thunderbirds, four of them which were hugely successful, plus in particular uh, Lady Penelope's Rolls Royce. We licensed that to uh, Dinky Toys in Liverpool and I used to go up there with great pleasure. And 
they eventually sold in the UK alone two million pieces. Uh, it was die cast, and they had to produce another uh, another set of tools because the first one wore out. It was a hugely successful item, and that brought a lot of attention and focus because. Here was Dinky in those days, one of the leading companies. They eventually ran into problems, but uh, they were pretty powerful. And people liked to be associated with success and power, and that brought a lot of attention to what we were doing. It was a joint effort. Uh, I can, we used to sit round a think tank, if we had call it in today's parlance, and I say five of us, there'd be Jerry there, and Sylvia, uh, Reg Hill. Reg was a lovely guy. He'd, Good morning, Keith. No. I say, Reg, I haven't even asked the question, but you, you had to just get the guy warmed up. But he was great. And then John Reed and myself. And we used to sit around and we say, would this work? And we were not afraid of putting any idea on the table. Because if it didn't work, you'd just leave it on the table. If it did work, you'd pick it up and develop it. And uh, we were small enough and flexible enough to respond to ideas almost to the point of you could ch change the script if it, if it made sense to build something in. And uh, it was it was very much a team effort with Jerry uh, rightly um, leading and everybody happy to respond to that. And, uh, Jerry had this uh, knack of bringing the right people together and he brought a lot of talent into the company. Up to Thunderbirds, we had almost driven it by the seat of our pants. Uh, after Thunderbirds, I think it probably needed slightly more scientific management, and it, that wasn't available. Uh, and therefore, I think it brought about the decline. Uh, we had a ATV initially. I, I would say the honeymoon was marvelous, but the marriage was not a success. That's the way I put it in the kindest terms. I use the expression, I think the salt had lost its flavor. That's the way I put it. Uh, and I parted company uh, at the end of the 60s, I think 69, I'm not sure. They, they changed the name of the company to ATV Merchandising, um, and it was run by my number two, Richard Cully, New Zealander. But he, I met him in the early 60s when he was working for Tuckwell, and he joined us. Uh, we had quite a we had quite a team, but we had an office in um, Mays Court, and that was where we were based when I uh, passed the company and um, set up my own operation, uh, which had great success and great failure. Uh, reformed Century Twenty One in 1975 with Jerry as a shareholder, and we built seventy from from 75. I had an office here at Pywood built it from nothing to uh, a very successful company. We handled all the licensing for ABBA. We did Paul Daniels. We did uh, uh, World Wrestling Federation, would you believe? WWF. Um, did Power Rangers. And then uh, I thought the time had come to fold the tent. So I'm now, I still got Century 21 and we've got another company called Century 22. <laughs> Top secret. Subject. International rescue. Well, character, I, I probably... Um, it was probably the hood. It's a, a close call between the hood and Lady Penelope. I mean, I, I, the hood was so... He was uh, very much a secondary character when he was cast, but he emerged as the, uh, as the villain of the piece, and he became quite important, difficult to merchandise. But he was a wonderful sounding board for the uh, and a foil for the rest of the uh, the rest of the cast. Um, I think Lady Penelope and Park, and, uh, and I'm sure Jerry told you that Park was based on the barman at the uh, the pub in Head Um Parker, I think, was great because he was a real he was a real person. He was. <laughs> Uh, I, I, you know, I have a tremendous affection for them all, but uh, the one I recall today, I say that I like the hood, uh, and I like the relationship between uh, Lady Penelope and Parker. Those are the two, I think, that I would highlight. People were taking note of us because we, we, with each successive series, we had Supercar, we had Fireball XL5, we had Stingray, and then Thunderbird. We, we were on the escalator, and... Um, 
we could uh, we could produce magic. So everybody applauded Thunderbirds. Um, they loved it, and I think that was probably the peak of our creativity and success. Certainly for me, I think that was absolutely marvelous. And uh, uh, it was known around the world. And Japan was, uh, it's still a major uh, force in Japan, the Thunderbirds. There are a lot of devotees and they keep playing it and playing it and playing it. Fathers would take their children, I mean, whichever way around, it was rather like fathers playing with the train set. It was, it was a must in families. They had to go and watch Thunderbirds because this was almost the highlight of the week for them. It sounds strange to say for a show of that nature, but it was really a very important piece of television. And uh, I think it was uh, different. What's the, there's nothing quite comparable um, in today's terms because there is so much there. There's nothing that stands out. I mean, Thunderbird was head and shoulders above anything else in its field. And it was a true family show. And you could, your grandmother could watch it, your three-year-old could watch it, nobody could be offended, but everybody could be entertained. That's my view. We fully expected it to go on, and I believe it should have gone, uh, but it was driven by, you know, commercial considerations. Uh, the intention was that we would get on the network in, um, in the States, and I believe NBC, in fact, I know NBC made a significant offer for it. And we'd been on the previous um, uh, network deal we had was with uh, Fireball XL5, that was our, we, we got on the network with NBC with that. So we had a precedent for it, but it ended up going on syndication, and on syndication the money is more slow, you know, it comes in more slowly, um, and it was decided to produce yet another series. Well, it's incredibly difficult to create by, uh, by command, you know. I think creativity is inspirational, and if you are doing it to the calendar on the clock, it's, it's not always easy. But that's what we were called upon to do. And Jerry came up with the idea of uh, Captain Scholars. I, I think uh, at the time we probably didn't realize, but there's a, you know, there's a turning point in any piece of history, and um, without being dramatic about it, but I think supermarination is part of history. Um, I think that was probably a turning point. I certainly think things would have been different if they'd continued with uh, Thunderbirds. I think. Uh, even if they'd rested it and come back uh, the following season, I think it could have been developed and built. I mean, th there are talks going on today about making a, a, a movie of Thunderbird, so if it's good enough for today, I think he would have been good enough for a, a further series uh, in those days. It had the legs. It had the, uh, the basic concept, I think, was right for, for continuing. It's, so yes, I think he was significant and probably more so then we realized that we still had the drive and enthusiasm to go on with Captain Scrolls and the Mistrons and uh, the new style characters, which uh, at the time we all believed you know, it was right. But again, in retrospect, I think uh, the characters should have evolved perhaps not quite so dramatically. I, we changed from caricatures to humanoid characters, which um, uh, was probably uh, a quantum leap, which it should have been, if it was going that direction, it should have been phased in. It should have been it, evolution rather than rev revolution, that's my feeling. But uh, again, at the time, it was felt to be right. And Captain St Scholar was received with great enthusiasm and acclaim. But uh, it was more, it was moving the program slightly to a slightly older age group um, and probably changed the flavor of, of, light, of the licensing and the merchandise. Oh, that's all. Um, but the times in the 60s, in the 60s, we believed that everything was possible. And notwithstanding the, uh, the difficulties of raising the money and, and so forth, but we would literally, um, we'd go and break the hostel, not literally break the hostel, but we would make things happen. Uh, marvelous time. And it was, uh, there were five quite different people which I think is good, you know, because you have different philosophies, different cultures, different language, all coming together. And I think the series is, is and was and a product of, of those the different minds. Since when have you been the great man of action? Well, if you're going to take that attitude. My attitude? Gentlemen, gentlemen, please.
we we used to operate in concert. We had a club of five. Jerry was the the leader, and I was fortunate enough to be one of the members of the club, and I was very happy so to be. The the, the biggest show naturally, properly went to Jerry and Sylvia. That because it was their free trial. I mean, that's right and proper. And then uh, probably next in ranking would be, um, not probably, certainly next in ranking would be John, uh, John Reed and Reg Hill. And then because I was the latest, last to join the group, uh, there was Keith Shackleton. Uh, but I, I had no problem with that because uh, unto Caesar that which is due to Caesar. And, um, that's right and proper. And if we'd kept that going, it's still around today. Nobody came to have so well. See, I think that's a myth. So nobody was uh, short of a penny or two. Um, somebody, somebody squandered their birthright. Somebody made bad investments. Uh, but I think everybody associated with those times uh, has had a full and rich career. I mean, I had tough years from uh, the early 70s. I put it down in, to my own decision, so I uh, don't ask for any sympathy on that. Um, Jerry... Uh, when you come off a high, it's very difficult to understand and accept that it's not continuing. So I think Jerry almost felt that there was a God-given right that he should go on at the same level he'd been enjoying. Uh, that was probably the time for taking a step back and taking stock and thinking, well, what, what has changed, what has happened, and so forth. So I think to some extent... Uh, you know, that was part of the problem. And of course, the early 70s, 74 was different. You know, we had inflation, and oil prices went through the roof, the economy went uh, through the floor. Um, so it was a difficult time, and people, I think, were being very cautious. Uh, so I think you had to be fairly, uh, I use the word again, nimble to find a niche for yourself. And I think Jerry should have found a new niche for himself, which uh, I know he made. He had a, a number of efforts, and he made some. He made uh, Duffel Doppelganger, I think, in those days, which uh, lovely concept. I uh, didn't uh, probably earn its corn at the box office. Um, so uh, between from seventy to seventy-five, I used to see Jerry socially. It was in seventy-five that we got together again, and I say I found uh, the Century Twenty One had lapsed as a name. And we picked it up again and ran with it. Lou Grade had it, so but when his empire went into 72, everything fell to the ground. So we were surprised to find that the name was still there, and we restarted. Jay was on the board, very much passive, because he was involved in Space 1999, I think, at the time, which was probably part of his resurgence. And the first, ep the first series of Space 1999, I thought, was pointing in the right direction. Then they brought some American influence on board. Fred, I can't think of his name now, producer, co-producer. Um, and it didn't, it didn't develop its full potential. And therefore, I think what might have happened with Space 1999 um, didn't happen. I mean, one of the things I did, I got hold of... Um, I just heard a buzz that the... A book in the States called The Making of Star Trek had sold four million copies, which is not a copy, is it? So I thought, The Making of Space 1999. So I got hold of a guy called Tim Heald, who writes for The Telegraph and The uh, Radio Times. We got him down at the studio, and a splendid lunch and a chat, and we got him to write a uh, synopsis for a book called The Making of Space 1999. And I sold this on a one-page letter to a company in New York called Ballantines, who had published the um, the Star Wars book, Star Trek book, sorry, Star Trek book. And they we got a contract. And we got Tim to write the book. Uh, we got Red Shell to design the cover. And we went to press. And we didn't sell them four million copies, we sold 40,000. And I would say that it was two for two reasons. The, the design of the car was wrong, the book cover was wrong, but the series didn't take off in the States. But it should have done. It, it had the makings of, uh, of another Star Trek. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd put the positive spin on it. If we'd, if we'd kept together, I think we could, have, we could have regrouped and formed a... An I wouldn't say an entity of the Empire, because that sounds too grand. 
it could still be going today. And that was my dream. And that's the, the regret I have, is that that is not still there today, because it could have been. It should have been and could have been. And for reasons, for things that happened in the late 60s, uh, it, 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 it's not been it. But uh, I'm a romantic at heart, you see. I stay with Pontiac, and I like things to go on forever. And I think it could have gone on forever, but it didn't. Um, we did have some wonderful times, and uh, I say again, it was it was it was great. Does that answer the question? Thank you.